Hi, I'm Dr. Mike McKinnis. I'm one of the chief educators at Doctors in Training, and I want to welcome you to this solid anatomy lecture on the perineum. Now, I'll be back for a clinical correlation in the end of session quiz a little bit later, but for right now, I'm going to turn you over to our primary lecturer, Dr. John Phelan. If you've watched the solid anatomy lecture on the pelvic wall, you may recall that the area just inferior to the pelvis is the perineum. Organs involved in copulation, reproduction, digestion, and micturition pass through the perineum. The muscles and the fascia of the perineum assist in the support of the pelvic viscera, and the external genitalia take their origin from the perineum. The floor of the perineum is the skin between the thighs. The roof is the pelvic diaphragm which is the combination of the levator ani and the coccygeus that separates the perineum from the pelvis. Centrally located in the perineum is the perineal body or central tendon of the perineum, to which fascial layers and muscles, including part of the levator ani, attach and anchor themselves. Damage to the perineal body, which often occurs during childbirth, leads to destabilization of the perineum, which may result in the prolapse of organs, such as the rectum and the vagina, that are supported by the tissues of the perineum. The lateral borders of the perineum can be considered identical to those of the inferior pelvic aperture, which are the subpubic angle, the sacrotuberous ligaments, and posteriorly, the sacrum and the coccyx. A more simple representation of the perineal borders is a parallelogram whose vertices are the tip of the coccyx, the pubic symphysis, and the right and left ischial tuberosities, which delimits a diamond between the thighs. A line connecting the ischial tuberosities divides the perineum into the urogenital triangle anteriorly and the anal triangle posteriorly. The anal triangle is occupied by the centrally located anal canal with the ischioanal fossae lateral to it. The ischioanal fossae are fat-filled spaces that are often referred to as wedge-shaped. The floor of the fossae is the skin over the anal triangle, and the roof is the levator ani. The levator ani also forms the medial wall of the fossa, along with the external anal sphincter. The lateral wall is the obturator internus. The levator ani overlaps the obturator internus, so part of the obturator internus is in the pelvis and part is in the perineum, or more specifically, in the ischioanal fossa. On the medial surface of the obturator internus against the lateral wall of the ischioanal fossa, there is a gap in the obturator internus fascia named the pudendal canal. The pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal artery and vein run through this canal. Within the canal, the inferior rectal nerve, artery, and vein branch from the pudendal neurovascular bundle, pass through the wall of the pudendal canal, traverse the fat-filled ischioanal fossa, and supply the external anal sphincter and part of the levator ani on the medial wall of the ischioanal fossa. The rectum leaves the abdomen and passes through the superior pelvic aperture to enter the pelvis. It ends at the anorectal junction at the level of the pelvic diaphragm. Forming a sling around the rectum at this junction is the puborectalis muscle, which is a component of the levator ani, which makes up part of the pelvic diaphragm. The continuation of the rectum in the perineum is the anal canal. The external opening of the anal canal is the anus. Within the anal canal are anal columns, which are vertical folds in the mucosa formed by underlying blood vessels. The anal columns end at the irregular pectinate line or dentate line, which is marked by a horizontal row of folds in the mucosa called the anal valves. The portions of the anal canal superior and inferior to the pectinate line have different embryological origins and therefore have different blood supplies and nerve supplies. Superior to the pectinate line, 
Blood is supplied to the anal canal by the superior rectal artery. You may recall from the Solid Anatomy lectures on the abdomen that the superior rectal artery is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery, which is an unpaired branch of the abdominal aorta. The inferior rectal artery, which is a branch of the internal pudendal artery, supplies blood to the portion of the anal canal inferior to the pectinate line. The superior and inferior rectal arteries are connected by anastomoses formed by the middle rectal artery, which branches off of the internal iliac artery, or one of its branches. The veins responsible for draining the anal canal are named identically to, and cover the same territory as, the arteries supplying the anal canal. The superior rectal vein drains into the inferior mesenteric vein, which drains into the splenic or the superior mesenteric vein, which in turn drains into the portal vein. The inferior rectal vein drains into the internal pudendal vein, which drains into the internal iliac vein, which drains into the common iliac vein, which joins the contralateral common iliac vein, to form the inferior vena cava. Forming a venous plexus with the superior and inferior rectal veins is the middle rectal vein, which drains from distal to proximal into the internal iliac vein, the common iliac vein, and the inferior vena cava. This venous plexus is a site of porticaval anastomosis, a connection between the portal venous system and the caval that is, vena caval, vena system, and is the area where internal hemorrhoids develop. Innervation to the mucosa of the anal canal below the pectinate line is provided by the inferior rectal nerve, a branch of the internal pudendal nerve. This nerve provides somatic innervation, so this mucosa is sensitive to touch, pain, and temperature. Above the pectinate line, the mucosa of the anal canal receives only autonomic innervation provided by branches from the inferior hypogastric plexus. The mucosa above the pectinate line is insensitive to pain and temperature and is only sensitive to stretch. The muscles surrounding the anal canal are the external anal sphincter on the medial wall of the ischioanal fossa and the internal anal sphincter deep to it. The external anal sphincter is voluntary and innervated by the inferior rectal nerve, while the internal anal sphincter is involuntary and innervated by sympathetic branches of the inferior hypogastric plexus. The coordination of the anal sphincters and the mechanics of defecation are discussed in the Solid Anatomy lecture on the pelvic viscera. Welcome back. I want to take a few minutes here to discuss some of the anatomical distinctions that Dr. Phelan is describing here in this first section of the video. In particular, I want to talk about hemorrhoids. So the first question in this section of your study guide says, what are hemorrhoids? Well, hemorrhoids are dilated rectal veins in the wall of the anus caused by the increased pressure in the rectal vein. So what causes them? Well, lots of different things are associated with an increased risk of hemorrhoids, and you can think of these being things that increase the pressure. For instance, constipation is going to increase pressure because you're straining to defecate. Uh, pregnancy causes increased pressure in the abdomen and in, in the pelvis as well. Sitting for long periods of time can increase the risk of hemorrhoids. And really, anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure will do it. Now, Dr. Phelan already discussed the drainage pattern of the rectal vein, so I don't want to go over that here in detail, but I do want to highlight a couple of points. The first point is that the superior rectal vein drains via the inferior mesenteric vein into the portal system. And then the middle and inferior rectal veins drain into the systemic circulation via the inferior vena cava. Now, between these rectal veins, there's an anastomosis. And this is one of the sites of portal systemic anastomoses. Now, the reason this is all clinically important is that portal hypertension, like we see in patients with cirrhosis, can cause dilation of these portal systemic anastomoses in these rectal veins, and that's going to lead to internal hemorrhoids. So, portal hypertension is an increase in blood pressure in the portal venous system, and that pressure backs up all the way to the rectum and causes hemorrhoids. 
But most of the time, hemorrhoids are due to things like constipation and pregnancy and increased intra-abdominal pressure rather than something scary like cirrhosis. The other important anatomic landmark with regard to hemorrhoids is the pectinate line or the dentate line. This is a landmark that distinguishes internal from external hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids that are found proximal to the pectinate line are called internal hemorrhoids, and then hemorrhoids distal to the line are called external hemorrhoids. So distal to the line, you have somatic innervation. This is part of the mucosa that's sensitive to touch and pain and temperature. But proximal to that pectinate line, the mucosa of the anal canal receives only autonomic innervation, not somatic innervation. So the mucosa proximal to that pectinate line is not sensitive to pain and temperature. It's only sensitive to stretch. Because of this, internal hemorrhoids are not painful, but external hemorrhoids can be painful. So be aware of that distinction. All right, let's pick back up with the lecture. Anterior to the anal triangle is the urogenital triangle. This half of the perineum is divided into vertically stacked pouches by layers of fascia. Superior to the skin is the superficial perineal fascia, often referred to by the eponym Collie's fascia. This layer is continuous with the dartos fascia of the penis, scrotum, and labia majora, and with scarpa's fascia in the abdomen. Continuing superiorly, the next layer of fascia is the perineal membrane, a very thin but tough layer of fascia that spans the ischiopubic rami. The vagina and urethra pass through it. Between the superficial perineal fascia and the perineal membrane is the superficial perineal space, or pouch. Continuing superiorly from the perineal membrane, the next layer of fascia is the fascia of the levator ani. Between the perineal membrane and the fascia of the levator ani is the deep perineal pouch, or space. The roof of the deep perineal pouch is incomplete because it is found at the level of the urogenital hiatus, which allows passage of the urethra and the vagina. The superficial perineal pouch is occupied by three muscles, branches of the pudendal neurovascular bundle, and erectile tissue. In females, there is also a gland in this pouch. And in males, since the superficial perineal fascia is continuous with the dartos fascia, the entire contents of the scrotum is within the superficial perineal pouch as well. The three muscles in the superficial perineal pouch are arranged as bilateral triangles. At the base of the triangle, the superficial transverse perineal muscle attaches to the ischial tuberosity laterally and the perineal body in the midline. It provides some support for the viscera occupying the pelvis, but its size obviously limits its contribution to this action. Textbooks often list its function as stabilization of the perineal body. Attached to the medial edge of the ischiopubic ramus is the ischiocavernosus muscle. Anchored to the perineal body inferiorly and oriented vertically is the bulbospongiosus muscle. In the male, the left and right bulbospongiosus muscles are fused at the midline along a median raphe. In the female, the vestibule of the vagina lies between the separate right and left bulbospongiosus muscles. The superficial transverse perineal muscle lies in direct contact with the perineal membrane, but the ischiocavernosus muscle and the bulbospongiosus muscle cover erectile tissue. The two types of erectile tissue found in the perineum, the corpus spongiosum and the corpus cavernosum, are named differently according to their location. And while some investigators have noted differences between these two tissues at the microscopic level, they are not particularly distinct histologically or grossly. These tissues consist of a trabecular connective tissue network with widespread interconnected vascular channels. This construction gives the erectile tissues a sponge-like appearance hence spongiosum in cross-section, with numerous observable cavernous spaces, hence cavernosus, throughout. 
The corpus spongiosum and cavernosum are fed by branches of the internal pudendal artery. During sexual arousal, the erectile tissues fill with blood and become tumescent. A thin, tough, elastic outer covering, the tunica albuginea, keeps blood from flowing out of the structures composed of these erectile tissues. The ischiocavernosus muscles cover the proximal portions of the corpora cavernosa, that's the plural of corpus cavernosum, which form columns of erectile tissue that run along the medial edge of the ischiopubic rami and join at the midline anteriorly to contribute to the body of the penis or clitoris. The portions of the corpora cavernosa that are attached to the ischiopubic rami are called the crura, singular is crus, of the penis or clitoris. When the ischiocavernosus muscles contract, they compress the crura of the penis or clitoris and force blood anteriorly into these organs, assisting in erection. The bulbospongiosus muscle covers the corpus spongiosum, erectile tissue that forms the bulb of the penis and, in the female, the bilateral bulbs of the vestibule or vestibular bulbs. Here, the term vestibule refers to the vestibule of the vagina, which is the area between the labia majora anterior to the vaginal orifice. In the male, the bulbospongiosus muscle has two functions. One is to compress the bulb to force urine and semen through the urethra, which runs through the bulb. The other is to squeeze blood through the corpus spongiosum, which not only composes the bulb of the penis, but also contributes to the shaft and composes the glands, to assist in erection. In the female, the association of the vestibular bulbs with the urethra and the clitoris is controversial, so the function of the bulbospongiosus muscle is still a matter of discussion. At the posterior end of the bulb of the vestibule is the greater vestibular gland, or Bartholin's gland which secretes lubricating mucus through a duct to the vestibule of the vagina in response to parasympathetic innervation during sexual arousal. This gland is partially covered by the bulbospongiosus muscle. The pudendal neurovascular bundle gives off several branches as it passes through the superficial perineal pouch. The perineal nerve provides motor innervation to the superficial transverse perineal, bulbospongiosus, and ischiocavernosus muscles. The scrotal and labial branches of the pudendal nerve run to the skin to provide sensory innervation. The internal pudendal artery gives off the artery to the bulb of the penis or vestibule, which supplies the corpus spongiosum, and the deep artery of the penis or clitoris, which supplies the corpus cavernosum. The collection of external genitalia in the female is the vulva, or pudendum. In Latin, pudendus means shameful or disgraceful. The fatty eminence over the pubic symphysis is the mons pubis. Although usually associated with females, males also have a mons pubis. Its function is considered to be protection of the underlying superior pubic ramus. The labia majora are fat-filled folds of skin. Following puberty, the skin over the labia majora and the mons pubis becomes covered with hair. Recall from the solid anatomy lecture on the anterior abdominal wall that the round ligament of the uterus passes through the superficial inguinal ring and becomes anchored within the labia majora. The area between the labia majora is the pudendal cleft. Within the pudendal cleft is another pair of folds of skin, the labia minora. Unlike the labia majora, they do not contain fat and they are hairless. The right and left labia minora are joined posteriorly in the midline of the frenulum of the labia minora. Anteriorly, a part of each labia minor passes superior to the clitoris and fuses at the midline to form the prepus of the clitoris. Another portion of each labum minor 
attaches to the ventral side of the clitoris to form the frenulum of the clitoris. The space between the labia minora is the vestibule of the vagina. Within the vestibule of the vagina is found the vaginal orifice posteriorly and the external urethral opening anteriorly. Lateral to the vestibule are the bulbs of the vestibule and the greater vestibular gland. Covering these structures, as mentioned moments ago, is the bulbospongiosis muscle. The clitoris is the organ of sexual arousal in the female. The corpora cavernosa form the right and left crus of the clitoris, which are attached to the medial edge of the ischiopubic rami and the adjacent perineal membrane. The crura join at the midline, anterior and inferior to the pubic symphysis, to form the body of the clitoris, which is attached proximally to the pubic symphysis by the suspensory ligament of the clitoris. Anatomical position of the clitoris is based on anatomical position of the penis, which is described in the erect state. Thus, the anterior surface is the anatomical dorsum of the clitoris, and its posterior side is considered the ventral surface anatomically. The portion of the clitoris that projects beyond the labia minora is called the glands, which is covered on its dorsal surface by the prepus of the clitoris. While many textbooks claim that the glands is composed of corpus spongiosum or cavernosum, the most recent detailed studies of the clitoris indicate that the glands is a non-erectile, largely neuronal structure. The corpus spongiosum does not contribute to the crura, body, or glands of the clitoris. The dorsal, nerve, artery, and vein of the clitoris which are terminal branches of the pudendal neurovascular bundle, run along the dorsum of the body and glands of the clitoris. The dorsal nerve of the clitoris provides somatic sensory innervation to the clitoris. As mentioned previously, the crura of the clitoris are supplied by the deep artery of the clitoris, a branch of the internal pudendal artery. Sexual arousal triggers a parasympathetic response that results in the vasodilation of the branches of this artery, resulting in clitoral erection. Parasympathetics are also secretomotor to the greater vestibular gland, causing the gland to secrete lubricating mucus into the vestibule of the vagina during sexual arousal. The deep dorsal vein of the clitoris is found in the midline and communicates with the internal pudendal vein but primarily drains into the vesicle venous plexus surrounding the bladder. The vesicle venous plexus is one of several visceral venous plexuses found in the pelvis that ultimately drain into the internal iliac vein. The penis is the homologue of the clitoris. As in the female, the corpora cavernosa form its crura, which are attached to the ischiopubic rami and the adjacent perineal membrane, and which join at the midline to form the dorsal portion of the shaft of the penis. The suspensory ligament of the penis attaches the proximal part of the dorsum of the penis to the pubic symphysis. Unlike the clitoris, the corpus spongiosum is incorporated into the body of the penis. The corpus spongiosum forms the bulb of the penis, which is attached to the perineal membrane proximally, surrounds the spongy urethra along the length of the shaft of the penis and forms the glands of the penis distally. The widest part of the cone-shaped glands is the corona, and the recessed area just proximal to the corona is the coronary sulcus. The spongy urethra which is defined as the part of the urethra surrounded by the corpus spongiosum, opens at the external urethral orifice at the distal end of the glands. There is no sphincter at the external urethral orifice. The voluntary urethral sphincter is the sphincter urethrae in the deep perineal pouch. The involuntary urethral sphincter, which will be discussed further in the solid anatomy lecture on the pelvic viscera, is located at the base of the bladder. The components of the shaft of the penis, which are the left and right columns of corpora cavernosa that formed the crura, 
In the column of corpus spongiosum that surrounds the urethra on the ventral surface of the penis are held together by two layers of fascia deep to the skin. These are the dartos of the penis, which is continuous with the dartos fascia in the scrotum, and the deeper bux fascia. Both layers extend as far superiorly as the coronary sulcus. If superiorly sounds like the wrong direction, remember that in anatomical position, the penis is erect. Bux fascia arises anteriorly from the suspensory ligament of the penis and fuses posteriorly with the perineal membrane and is thus limited to the shaft of the penis. Deep to these two layers, each of the three columns of erectile tissue also has a thin but tough elastic covering called the tunica albuginea. You may recall from the solid anatomy lecture on the anterior abdominal wall that the capsule of the testes is also named the tunica albuginea. This is a general anatomical term that is Latin for white tunic. On the dorsum of the penis, deep to buck's fascia, is the dorsal nerve, artery, and vein of the penis, which are the terminal branches of the pudendal neurovascular bundle. The dorsal nerve of the penis provides sensory innervation to the penis. As mentioned previously, the corpora cavernosa are supplied by the deep artery of the penis, while the corpus spongiosum is supplied by the artery to the bulb of the penis. Both of these arteries are branches of the internal pudendal artery. Sexual stimulation triggers a parasympathetic response in the male that will have essentially the same effect as it does in the female. The parasympathetics from the inferior hypogastric plexus, originally from the pelvic splanchnics, cause smooth muscle in the vasculature of the erectile tissue to relax, resulting in vasodilation. As the erectile tissue fills with blood, the veins returning blood from the penis are compressed, restricting venous return. More blood moves into the penis than leaves, resulting in erection. Blood from the corpus spongiosum and cavernosum drains into the deep dorsal vein of the penis, which is found at the midline, like the deep dorsal vein of the clitoris, and is said to communicate with the internal pudendal vein. However, the deep dorsal vein of the penis primarily drains into the prostatic venous plexus, which communicates with other visceral venous plexuses within the pelvis that ultimately drain into the internal iliac vein. The superficial vein of the penis drains the skin and superficial fascia and ultimately drains into the superficial venous system of the thigh, which ends in the great saphenous vein. Skin over the mons pubis is inervated by the ilioinguinal nerve, a branch of the lumbar plexus that was discussed during the solid anatomy lectures on the abdomen. Skin over the labia majora and scrotum are innervated by the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, which is another lumbar plexus branch, and by labial and scrotal branches of the pudendal nerve. The perineal nerve, another branch of the pudendal nerve, innervates skin between the anus and the scrotum or labia majora. Finally, some of the skin around the anus and over the tip of the coccyx is innervated by branches from the coccygeal plexus. So that covers the perineum. Now I want you to pause the video and answer the intersection quiz questions, and then we're going to go through those answers together. All right, let's get started. First question, which rectal vein drains into the portal system and which rectal veins drain into the systemic circulation? So in the portal system, that's the superior rectal vein, and then the systemic circulation is the middle rectal vein and the inferior rectal vein. Next, is the external or internal anal sphincter voluntary? What's the external anal sphincter? And the internal anal sphincter is involuntary. That shouldn't be too hard to remember. Then what structure keeps blood from flowing out of the penis during an erection? That's the tunica albuginea. And what structure forms the bulb of the penis? That's the corpus spongiosum. Next one. What are the vertices of the urogenital triangle and of the anal triangle? So the vertices of the urogenital triangle are the ischial tuberosities and the pubic symphysis. 
And then the vertices of the anal triangle are the ischial tuberosities, again, just like in the urogenital triangle. And then the third vertex is the tip of the coccyx. Okay, so the last part here is the mock practical. So I want you to get some practice labeling the image in a time setting. Ready? Go.